Okay. So everybody got seats? There's some kind of up here in the front. There's some in the back. There's some in the back. Okay, we'll be fine. Great. Um, before we begin, we've got a couple of announcements here. We have the sign-up sheet for caucuses has been going well. And uh, what do we have over here? Let me see. We're going to have, uh, in room 234, this will all be posted out there, so you'll be able to like, peek at this when you come back. Uh, 234, there's going to be one on bisexuality. There's going to be in two, room 236, one on advisors and educators. Um, and that's specifically designed for the advisors and educators. Uh, then room 244 and 46, it'll be people of color, i.e. African American, Asian Pacific Islander, Latino Hispanic, Native American, or Mideastern. I'm told that I can't read. Okay, good. Room 234 is going to be uh, more of an issue-oriented one on domestic partnership issues. That's, uh, I think, more primarily oriented towards like college campuses and getting domestic partnership legislation. Um, let me see. Then we're going to be one in the gallery on allies. And uh, for the one in the gold room is going to be other gay, lesbian, bisexual issues. This is kind of like more of a general discussion on things. And then we still have one empty. Is there, is there anybody right now that wants to? Go ahead. <laughs> the weather? No. What's that? <laughs> Snow, just think of it that way. What's up? In the past month, the University of Minnesota president has approved the creation of a gay lesbian studies program, an administrative office for gay lesbian bi concerns, domestic partnerships, mandatory training for faculty and staff, plus updating all brochures for inclusive language. So we can talk about how we got that all done in about a month. So, <laughs> I'd like to introduce our new keynote speaker. Uh, <laughs> Just primarily a workshop on how to move ahead on your college campus with uh, political issues. Cool. That will be, oh boy. Well, I have the feeling we'll be switching that one with one of the other slightly bigger rooms. So, uh, yeah, let's move the allies to room 238. And, no, I don't have one with me. And then we'll be doing how to win in the gallery. <laughs> so, okay, you can set that down. Okay, um, otherwise, let me see, are there any other announcements for the moment? Okay, then, uh, as you all know, we've got a keynote speaker here by the name of Suzanne Denovan. And she's wonderful. Um, Suzanne Denovan uh, was the student body president and the chief officer of the Minnesota Student Association at the Twin Cities campus of the University of Minnesota. Um, as an out lesbian, Susan, Suzanne operated a campaign of co-leadership and activism, promoting the concept that self-determination, not mere survival, should be the ultimate political goal. Two months after her arrest during a campus demonstration, Suzanne won her office by more than double the votes of her opponent and double the margin of victory for any candidate within the pa past four years. Um, Suzanne believes that it's living, in living our lives honestly and openly, we claim the sphere of intimacy as a political space. From this space, we must realize our connection with other beings and events. Taking this responsibility means acting for social and ecological justice. She has spoken at various campuses across the Midwest given a plenary address at the National Organization for Women's Young Feminist Conference in Ohio, and she's presented workshops at various regional and national leadership conferences. Currently, Suzanne is employed at a major corporation headquartered in the Twin Cities. She's participating in formal Council for Queers in the workplace, and in the next year, she's aiming to secure a research internship in field work in the area of sustainable, and de sustainable development and agriculture. But in the meantime, she's just an awesome person. So, <laughs> Suzanne, everybody, let's give her a big hand. Thanks. God. I was feeling really proud of Gary there. He's from my campus. So, um, I want to start today before I really get into my speech by showing a few slides. Um, these are slides with historical significance to the queer movement. So um, I can't explain all of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say. I would received these slides from Jean Treader in the Twin Cities, who's the um, northern Midwest regional representative to the International Gay and Lesbian Archives. So um, we're just going to kind of zip through these as context. It's really hard to see because there's so much light. Um, I'm not going to talk about every one, but I'll tell you this one. It's kind of hard to tell. It's, the, um, it's an African 
dance, it's the Burdash, which people probably know about from um, indigenous spirituality. It's the third sex, and this is like the Burdash dance. Well, no, headless woman, what a surprise. <laughs> it's two men embracing with heads, really. This is um, a poster from 13th century Norwich, Norway, um, and it's the burning of a sodomite in 13th century Norway. That needs no explanation. This is um, a gay artist's detail on Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's significant to gay history in that it shows the two angels embracing. It's Oscar Wilde and James Sargent Singer. It's an 18th century transvestite. Two men in Paris. <laughs> so it's a newspaper in uh, New York City. Third sex plague spreads anew. Pansies blow US. <laughs> A lot of people would like to be blown. <laughs> Yanks hop abroad. <clears throat> Sapphic sisters scram. <laughs> it's a gay paper if you didn't know. Queer seeks sucker. This is in the um, Nazi death camps in Germany. So is that. <coughs> this is one of the first <coughs> photos after Stonewall that like was considered out an activist or whatever. A Japanese lesbian magazine. <coughs> An old lesbians conference. This is a, a military cartoon from, I can't remember the man's name, and I, I don't know if people can read it, but they're in this Jeep, I think. It's a Jeep, and this guy says, the hell you say, and I thought I was the only one in the army. He says, not hardly. <laughs> it's from the 1987 March on Washington. That's it, right? Right, okay. So that's sort of by way of context, which hopefully will make sense as we go through. Uh, as introduced, my name is Suzanne Denovan, and to begin with, I want to thank Stephen Lorimore and the Lesbian Gay Bisexual Alliance at Iowa State University for inviting me to speak to you all here today. The theme of this conference, Making It Perfectly Queer, certainly leaves open to me a wide range of topics to address, and generally I think I have a lot to say on most of them. But I think that today what would be most valuable for you and for me will be to share with you my experience as an organizer, out lesbian, and student body president at the University of Minnesota. A crucial element in politics is intimacy. In this spirit, I want to share with you some insights on coming out. At 16, as I walk home from basketball practice, it's all I can do to keep from crying. Instead, I curse and rage against something unknown inside of me. Why is she mad at me? The star sophomore center, tall, blonde, blue-eyed, muscled, and lithe. A girl I said I admired. I kept a hair of hers taped in my journal. <laughs> We'd had a falling out. Every night when I went to bed, I itched. 
Somehow I developed an allergy or something, and I went downstairs, pulling up my pajama, asking my mom, what's wrong? I feel more than hear her gasp as she looks at my back. She tells me it looks like I've been whipped. My hives are long and thin, raised welts, and look like the remnants of a whip slash. My mom rubs some lotion on them and sends me back to bed. I'm confused. It continues this way for weeks, even for years afterward. Every time I feel frustration or anger, it happens. My skin raises. Something inside me demands to come out. But just what is coming out? This time I'm 19. I tell my boyfriend that it's over. I need to be independent. I know even as I say this, what I mean is I need to be sexual with women. But I never speak those words or ask my questions of anyone. I try a different reality. I date a new boy, have him fuck me, just trying to exorcise this desire for women. I leave his dorm room in tears. I seek meaning for my confusion, my feelings. I seek an identity. I'm afraid I will lose my family, my friends, my home. I find a reflection for myself in the political community and in the bar scene. I make peace with my lesbian identity. Along the way, I lose some friends, and I miss my family. I want to share my joy with my mom, but how do I tell her? At age 21, over a beer for me and an OJ for her in a jazz club with the female vocalist singing the blues, I tell my mom I don't date boys. She says she knows. She has known since I was five. And as she cries, I wonder just what in me has been coming out. At the moment, I decided to risk what I had known about myself and my home by telling the truth about my lesbian identity. I couldn't have imagined putting into words what made this risk worthwhile. Today, I know it is the possibility of a real connection, of the joy I feel when I tell the truth about myself and it has received as truth. There is a chance that people will shut down connection. So many of my friends have lost their families to the truth. It is so difficult for us to relate to one another from an authenticity that has nothing to do with the stereotypes and categories we have been ingrained with since we were children. These categories that rule our intimate lives operate to control us and keep us isolated from one another. When we throw off the very real ties that bind, we are opening the door to a myriad of possibility that has been closed. Why do we, as queer people, describe these limitations on the way to relate on the way to love as oppression. So many times we have heard people say, I don't care what you do in private, just don't flaunt it. How does compliance with this request keep these people safe? How is coming out a political act? The ruling class needs to control the intimate sphere. As Kaylee Hagan, lesbian feminist theorist says, intimacy is a prerequisite for access to the subordinate which the dominator must have to maintain and exert control. Intimacy can be invasion, incest, brainwashing, torture. Violence can be very intimate. The intimate sphere is also the context and precondition for connection. Connection can reveal the illusions that sustain domination. And so they silence our words, our art, ignore our families and our lives. The people who have come before us have given us many tools in this battle to create a self-affirming language, and I honor them. And the time now, our time, is to continue on in claiming our most complete selves, our fullest humanity. We must be warriors who are ready to define a new road of living and a new political movement. When I have come, to queer, come together with queer people and talked about the messages of shame I received, about same-sex love, there is connection. In this space, a real physical location, like this room in the Union, we challenge domination. And this opening, this outing, threatens to throw everything in the status quo into upheaval. How can people like Anne Imelda Redis, while holding the position of chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, censor homoerotic art and be a lesbian? because she is closeted. She hasn't taken the steps to smash 
the bindings of shame. She is isolated in her closet and cannot feel her connection to me as another lesbian, nor to queer art as necessary for our thriving. To connect requires responsibility. Identifying as queer means we must look out for one another. And I believe we should mean everyone who claims the word queer. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, hustler, celibate, etc. Claiming this connection and taking this responsibility, we must work for li the liberation from these confines that are now used to control us as queers, as women, as people of different races, different ethnicities and classes. Our movement must cross these categories as well. We cannot stop comfortably connected on queer. Claiming my connection in this intimate sphere means that now I am urged to struggle for the issues that affect my community. It is difficult to put into words how I feel this connection. Whenever I see the face of injustice, it registers in my body. I can no longer believe in all of the bigotry I have been taught. In this connection, I can't see why interracial marriages are supposedly bad. I can't see why whites should live in one neighborhood and blacks, Hispanics, Arabs, Jews, etc. should live in another neighborhood, usually of a lower property value. I don't see why it is okay for us to keep building nuclear reactors as we fill our landfills in our consuming energy appetites. I don't see why we export our industries, our toxic industries, to the third world. And I don't see the justification for paying Chinese workers 57 cents an hour in a sweatshop. These issues are in my space, in my body, as a queer person connecting with other queer people. And so we must speak. We must use our voices, our languages, to battle the voids of silence and invisibility. We must say it whenever and however we can. I speak, therefore I am. This affirms our right and our fight to live. We are a threat. We are coming out to change the world. And when we are finished, we will have created a space where we can each determine for ourselves our names and we will speak them proudly. This time, our time, is also a time when we are rapidly hounded, when our civil rights are denied in Colorado, challenged in state legislatures and in the Supreme Court. It is a time when we must face the willful ignorance of mainstream society as thousands of us die from AIDS, gay bashers, and suicide. This incredible ignorance, this silence, continues to reinforce the closets of those who would come out as queers or to support queers. <coughs> and as Marlon Riggs, black gay cultural activist says, our communities are robbed, not so much through the regular warlike attrition of our best and brightest, but by the loss of every man, woman, and child who spent a lifetime learning to speak his or her true and proper name and was cut short in this profound and noble act of self-articulation. So speak and listen. Listen to the differences and feel. Feel how we connect with each other. In our struggle to self-define, self-determine, and self-articulate, we will change the world. We can stop the madness of accumulation and greed. We can eliminate the 30% of suicides being committed by queer youth. We can create a workplace with fair wages and safe conditions. We must take control of our intimate lives and make intimacy a connection. We must take the risk to speak. And that means each and every one of us in whatever ways it is possible for us to come out as queer or friend of queers, we are making change. We each are important to the movement. There is a mistaken assumption that only those in the public eye are creating change. This is not so. Change is created in different ways by different people. Each person brings unique gifts and abilities to the organization, cause, or issue at hand. It is important for us to rethink the institutional structure of leadership. 
the top-down approach doesn't work. In my view, leadership is not about someone being out in the front, pulling a bunch of people along, but rather about being in the center and pushing people out in the directions they need and want to go. <coughs> Many of us have recognized the problems inherent in a top-down management style. We have changed the way we do business. The concept of co-leadership is becoming more popular. In my campaign for student body president, the groundswell of enthusiasm for change made itself known. In my campaign, we ran a truly joint effort. While I was the person seeking the office, it was a team of people who held similar values that got me elected. And in doing so, the election was really more about values than personalities. We operated a campaign of co-leadership. Media interviews were only given in groups, sometimes without me present. The decisions about the top four issues to press in the campaign, which endorsements to seek and use, and all campaign strategy were collectively made. This was a way of operating that people were ready for and relieved to see. The outpouring of support was tremendous. At the University of Minnesota, a few student organizations list their endorsements. We sought the endorsement of each of these organizations, including the university's fraternity and sorority system. We never lost an endorsement. Even though one of my imposing candidates was the incumbent and a member of a fraternity, we received the endorsement of the Greek system. As a team with a radical, recently, uh, recently arrested out lesbian at the helm, we won this endorsement. Why? I think there are two reasons. The first being that our team recognized the changing nature of organizations. We saw cooperation as the key to success. This is the way things get done, with different people bringing their skills and abilities to bear on the problem at hand. We trusted the people who were giving endorsements to be genuinely interested in issues, people who were playing a part in the process even though they didn't have the time or interest in being elected as a representative. We saw their contributions as valid. We did not approach them as people who wanted to play kingmaker or garner special political clout. They were students who had a stake in, it, in their community and in its governance. This attitude that everyone has a role, that it was everyone is important, was conveyed in our teamwork and in our endorsement interviews. It certainly did not make everyone happy. Our college paper was very uncomfortable to interview what one reporter called a posse. <laughs> but they learned to deal with it and ended up believing in our approach too. This was the beginning of my living and learning that everyone has a different role to play and everyone needs to be supported in that role. But I will come back to that. I believe the second reason we received so much support is because we had courage. We had integrity. We could have taken the angle that my sexual orientation was immaterial to the campaign and tried to closet it. If we had done that, I am convinced that we would have lost. It was through telling the truth about our values, <clears throat> as radical as they sounded, and ourselves, as radical as we were, that we earned the trust of the students at the University of Minnesota. When we took our case to the students, we knew there would be questions. We didn't get righteous about them. We accepted them, no matter how uninformed they seemed to be to us. Remarkably, the questions related to sexual orientation were few, and the smears were almost non-existent. The questions related to what, we, to what we planned to actually do were many. This openness, however, is what distinguishes us on the campaign team as leaders. This openness is also one important quality which distinguishes each of us here today who is out as leaders. There are many challenges to being an example, to be out and open about your leadership ability. You open yourself up to criticism. By some standards, being out as a queer leader means you invite cannibalism. Being out as a queer leader in a mainstream group can be the other side of the pincher. Let me share with you one story from my experience as president. As the new president, 
I was expected to endorse a candidate for the Speaker of the Legislative Forum, basically the position of Vice President. My selection was a straight, white, Army ROTC cadet <clears throat> from Iowa. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> he had been an important part of the campaign team. He supported the sanctions on ROTC until ROTC would comply with the university's equal opportunity policy, protecting against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. The gay men's organization on campus was upset because I hadn't endorsed a candidate from their organization. I didn't have as good or as close a working relationship with this gay candidate. My integrity meant that I had to choose the person I thought I could work best with, and that was the choice I made. Straight, white, male, and army. But it meant that I was subjected to questioning. I'm sure you all know the questions I'm talking about. The questions about whether or not you are truly a subversive. The doubts about whether or not you are radical enough. And honey, if you are living with courage and integrity, you are more than radical enough. And to bring home again the point that everyone is important, everyone has a different role to play. It is important that the straight people who support us are recognized as revolutionary too. In my story, the man who I endorsed risked his commission and scholarship to speak against ROTC policy. Why did he do this? Because through intimacy with queer people, for the first time in his life, intimacy with queer people, he became connected to the struggle and had to play his part. These actions of alliance must be rewarded and supported. But the danger is having the place you thought was your home seemingly evaporate an experience strikingly similar to coming out for the first time as queer. This is a frightening prospect. When the folks you thought would support you start to talk against you, it becomes difficult to stay focused on your integrity and truth. I see this so often that our movement victimizes the people who would rise to be examples for us. We start to question their motives wonder if they have too much ego invested in their jobs. The gossip starts, a snide comment here, um, a whisper there, and a landslide begins. Some people will not participate in this gossip, but a few determined people can bring anybody down. The meetings are secret, not in the open. The target is rarely asked to defend themselves. The talk can range. They're not out enough. They're too assimilationist. They're not radical enough. They're too radical. But where is the integrity? Where is the courage in such challenges of our leaders? It seems that those challenges probably have their source in something other than the collective good. From my view, it appears to be the result of insecurity. Sometimes our involvement in politics becomes a way that we get self-esteem. <coughs> When that is threatened somehow, we target another in our fear. It is important to check our motives. Are they really about the collective good? The way I will know when my questions are sincerely motivated is when I know I can be open and honest about them. I will approach the person I have a criticism of rather than discuss it with everyone else. I think a part of the problem is also the success of the gay lesbian civil rights movement. As the numbers of people aligned with the movement increase, so do the different kinds of talents and ideologies. It is expecting too much of our leaders to be able to reflect back all of the ideologies of the queer community. A leader like Irvish Evade, formerly of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, was criticized for not advancing, to the same degree, every path to queer liberation. Our movement is big enough to support many organizations with different paths on the same goal. We need to choose the timing and direction of our actions. We must examine the, the integrity of our criticisms <coughs> before we shoot down the first available target. The next time you feel frustrated with someone who has taken on the mantle of leadership, remember, every one of us is a leader. As long as we are out setting examples 
We are being leaders. In the animal medicine of some Native Americans, the mountain lion is leadership medicine. The words of wisdom about this medicine clearly state the meaning of leadership. The medicine says, therefore, the first responsibility of leadership is to tell the truth, know it and live it, and your example will filter down to the tiniest cubs in the pride. Responsibility is no more than the ability to respond to any situation. This is the leadership we can and do exercise. You will be tested. It is difficult. During the times when I felt like I had no community left with queers, I had to remember that I was not alone. Even when it felt that the queers who were organized at the University of Minnesota were not on my side, I knew that in standing up for my principles, I was not alone. Wonderful sources of inspiration have come to me in times of great need. Beyond the category of queer, which we have constructed for our political liberation, there are connections to be made with people that can be in your intimate truth space. And as much as we may wish that all gay people could connect with us there every time, there may be times when we are the only gay person there. Everyone is in a different place in their process. Just remember, you are not alone. As I said earlier, this was just the beginning of my learning and living the lesson that everyone is important. There is a Cherokee proverb that says, a drop of water alone may not seem like much, but together with many drops, it forms a river. A grain of sand may seem small, but with many grains of sand, you have made a mountain. <coughs> I know as a speaking transition, this is going to seem rough, but another key part of my living and learning that everyone is important and everyone has a role to play has been to remember the generations before me. The parts that they have played have shaped the opportunities that we have today. I have often been frustrated by folks of a different generation who do not accept the term queer as a positive one but I have never been in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with someone who held this position. Why? The obvious reason is that we have been denied our history institutionally, but we also have not taking, taken enough initiative to discover it. We are responsible for this, and believe me, I include myself in this. I have been quick to criticize what I have seen as problematic strategies from the past but slow to take my own advice about the criticism of leadership when it involves a different generation. I have not taken up my sincere questions with the people who have made these decisions. Why? Or this is actually, I want to take, this is a problem, why? <laughs> to move forward, we must have a sense of where we have been. The most obvious differences between now and the repression of the 50s are readily apparent to most of us. Yet how many of us realize that the Victorian age was in many ways a more permissive society sexually and gender-wise than it is today? Not knowing our history sets us up to fail. We live in a world where the obstacles of oppression do not stagnate. They will always rise to meet the challenges we pose in the name of justice. Most likely, obstacles or tactics used in the past will cycle back around. If we are connected with the generation that fought those obstacles when they first appeared, then we stand in a much better place to know how to fight them now. It is essential to our struggle to have a sense of place in our time. Again, like intimacy, this is a very real space, a physical space. It can be occupied by the memories we carry in our bodies, the fiction we write, our news stories, the archives we assemble, the museums we build to celebrate gay culture, and the degrees students earn in gay studies. It is crucial for us to claim this space in time, to ground ourselves in it and move out from it. We must learn our history, share our history, and preserve our history. I came to this understanding primarily through watching and participating in the feminist movement. I see the 90s as a wrenching time for the feminist movement. 
There is great confusion in choosing of which fronts to do battle on, and this confusion is exacerbated by the fact that there is little to no intergenerational communication happening. As a woman of the 90s, I face very different struggles than a woman of the 60s, and yet the feminist movement is generally not speaking to the women of my generation to understand that experience and to then incorporate it into the agenda. Nor did I, as a young organizing feminist, reach into the organizations that were primarily made up of women from another organization, from another generation. I do not want to see the same thing happen to the queer civil rights movement. How is this loss of history impacting more generally on the struggle for civil rights? My experience tells me that we are still doing organizing work with a lot of carryover from a time that has passed. I know this is sounding like it's up in the sky because it's conceptual, and I'll try to ground it better. Look at the way we generally divide up the work in our organizations. To refer again to my experience as the student body president, often there was a great deal of interest in a particular issue, but not many people would actually come to various committee meetings to work. We wanted to recruit volunteers, for example, committee members for the Legislative Relations Committee. The idea was that these volunteers would coordinate phone banks, letter writing campaigns, and student visits to lobby the legislature on issues of tuition and financial aid. Hundreds of students said they wanted to help, but the meeting times were bad, usually because they had class or work. They'd ask for an option other than going to a meeting to find out what they could do to help. Was there another option? Perhaps a phone call or a one-on-one -on -one with the chairperson of the Legislative Relations Committee. Sometimes the answer would be yes, but more often the answer would be no. The Minnesota Student Association could not accommodate most of the people interested in working with it. When the answer was yes, and an interested student became aware of the options of how he or she could help, generally the options didn't fit their needs. Weekly committee meetings clashed with more pressing obligations. A couple of weeks to get up to speed with the committee's mission meant lost enthusiasm. The transportation by bus to get home after 6 p.m. was dismal, so after school work was thwarted. And an organization set up to support the people who put in the big time and garner their share of the spotlight in the process, didn't know how to include the student with an off-campus job, child, and or the pressures of living in a racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist, nationalist, and classist culture. The organization is set up to best include white, economically secure U.S. citizens. Why? because it is based on the idea that people have leisure time to give to political action. Truly, how many of our organizations are based on the assumption that people have leisure time to give to political action? Only the most privileged students in today's society have leisure time to really get into the activist mode, given the way we organize the work today. As a queer movement, we must learn from these assumptions to create opportunities for participation at any level and from all segments of our community. This will move us into the 21st century, ahead of the pack. If you believe, as I do, that everyone is important to the whole, that we are all leaders with a part to play, then it is imperative to start to reorganize the way we think about work, and especially volunteer work. How can the tasks and responsibilities in our organization be redesigned to face the realities of a new century? This is where I urge you to get really creative. We are not just talking about creating change. We are talking about creative change. I am really just beginning to seriously ground these ideas, and so I know that they will be formed more concretely by so many other people. But I do have a few suggestions that may help kickstart other ideas. My first suggestion is to design a system in which work can be taken home. We are still so office-bound in our organizing. It will take a great deal of thinking to undo this, but it can be done. 
and once we get going in this direction, it will only be easier to expand. For example, if there is a budget for a portable computer, buy it. Figure out a way for people without office access to check this computer out and use it at home. I know it is expensive, but we really have to commit ourselves to making this reorganization of volunteer work a priority. Another suggestion is to make after-school transportation safe and accessible. Don't rely on the possibility that someone will be able to give Jane a ride home after the committee meeting. Figure out guidelines or policies so that a way home is something that can be counted on. If your campus bus has service that essentially ends at 6 p.m., like the University of Minnesota, propose changes to that system, perhaps adding one later night run. Often, folks on campus will have 20 or 40 or more minutes that they can stop in your office between classes and do some work. If your organization is like the Minnesota Student Association, you have no way to use these people's spare time. Try assembling a task list with estimated completion times. This way, students can choose what they want to do, put in their time, check it off, and walk away feeling great about having done something that they believe in. Another thing that can be done with this kind of time is reading the background literature that documents your actions. This background is useful because it will really help facilitate an intergenerational dialogue. Your reasons for taking the actions you did will have a written record. When people read it, the time it takes to get up to speed will decrease dramatically. You'll also find it satisfying to look back on your accomplishments and helpful to avoid your mistakes. At the core of these strategies is the belief that everyone is important and has a role to play. It is crucial for us to make the shift, not just in our thinking, but also in our budgeting and in our working, to a co-leadership focus with a grasp on today's economic reality. As I said, these suggestions are just the beginning of my thinking on the subject. There is much work to be done to further this line of thinking. I challenge those of you whose talents lie in system, in system thinking and conceptualizing to take up this path. And then you must talk about it with the people whose gift is turning the abstract to the concrete. And with those concrete strategies, the work will be taken over by the people who make things happen. Those who have communication and relationship skills must bridge the generations. And all throughout, our different gifts and perspectives will fine tune this new way of thinking and doing. It's 1993. Seven years from a new millennia. Are we ready to lead in this new era? We will be when we look to ourselves, a new generation, intimately connected to past and future generations, and find the wisdom that lies in our own space and time. Taking this knowledge and creating a different language of movement, of problem solving, and a different way of doing our work will ensure success beyond the 21st century. It is exciting to see the people gathered here who are taking on the responsibility of leadership. I challenge each of you to keep the next millennia and the past millennia in your minds and hearts. It is too easy to fall back into old ways of organizing. We must give each other support and hold each other accountable. I want us to spend a few minutes talking about this together, hear your ideas and your insights. But before opening it up, let me leave you with two blessings. First, from the mountain lion medicine. Become mountain lion by refusing to hide in the cave of your own shyness or uncertainty. Roar with conviction, roar with power, and remember to roar with <coughs> laughter to balance the medicine. And lastly, from my own origin, which is Celtic, more specifically Irish. May the mother bless you and keep you. May she make her face shine upon you. May the wind be always at your back. May the road rise to meet your feet. Thank you.
started late, so we're approaching the time that's scheduled for lunch. If people want to ask questions or talk a little bit, um, you'll have to commit to giving up some of your lunch time. <laughs> Otherwise, we could just go to lunch. Does anybody have any comments or ideas? I guess I was a winner. <laughs> really, there's no, nobody has anything that they want to say before we break? It's a hungry crowd. Thanks again. Enjoy the conference. Um, just to inform you, for those who are not from Iowa State, uh, there is a communes downstairs. It is cafeteria food. Um, eat at your own risk. Um, also, there is Campus Town. It's uh, a nice little walk.